This is the You, Me, and BTC podcast. Cryptocurrency decrypted. Welcome to episode 49. This week on the show, we're joined by King Dragon, the administrator of an altcoin exchange called Crypto Rush. He'll explain the history of his project and talk about where he plans to take it in the future. Then later on, we'll chat about some difficult questions that we've previously struggled with on the show. King Dragon will share some of his Crypto Rush experiences that shed new light on the best ways to approach regulation, bad actors, and more. Your hosts today are Tim Baker and myself, Daniel Brown. Here we go. Hey everybody, welcome to the show today. Thanks for joining us. I am Daniel Brown, and I'm here with Tim Baker. Hello everybody. And we're pretty excited. We're sitting down today with King Dragon, that's his handle online, and he is in charge of Crypto Rush, which is an altcoin exchange. So we're glad to have him. Thanks for joining us, King Dragon. Hey guys, thanks for having me. So I'll just go ahead and let you take it away. Tell us what Crypto Rush even is. What is it? What's it for? What can you do with it? Yeah, sure. So we'll go into a little a bit of backstory, I guess, if, um, you know, for some people that might be newer to, you know, this whole digital currency thing. Crypto Rush started as pretty much a place where you can go to buy and sell different cryptocurrencies. So let's say you went out and you were like, hey, I'm going to mine some Litecoin, but then you decided, well, you know, I don't really want to hold on to these Litecoin or I just saw a new you know, let's say something called doggy coin or doggy coin dark shop, you somehow have to convert your Litecoin over. So you would go to a place like Crypto Rush to basically buy and sell and convert these. You could almost think about about it like a digital currency uh, stock exchange. All right. Yeah, that's awesome. Can you tell us a little bit about how it got started, why you started it, maybe who all's involved with you? Just tell us about the history a little bit. Yeah, wow, that's going to be an interesting one. So it started back in uh, January of 2014 with the URL CryptoRush.in. So that's kind of what we're using currently. And it became pretty much a pretty big mecca for a lot of new coins that were popping up. So before a lot of the craziness happened, uh, I think they were at about 190 different currencies, which is really kind of a small number compared to, I don't know, how many, whatever thousand we've got running around today. But uh, they really focused a lot on just the community and figuring out what people were interested in, letting that drive the direction as opposed to, you know, people that had agendas and they wanted to list something, you know, to make a quick buck. So it was really cool because when somebody would bring something up or the community in general just wanted something changed, you know, Crypto Rush would just adapt to that and, you know, take care of things. Since, I want to say, April we've actually got a completely new crew now. So they kind of went through some really hard times. And in short, uh, Lincoln Zelda, the guy who started things, pretty much just got way over his head because uh, when they had originally built the site, you know, really good intentions, really good direction. Unfortunately, security wasn't really the strong point and they got hacked. So pretty much around April, uh, Lincoln Zelda basically kind of felt really overwhelmed and I kind of came onto the scene and after, I'd say, about two months or so of a lot of crazy people, I basically kind of <laughs> took over and um, been kind of driving the show ever since. And what's cool, though, is that right now, every single person that's kind of helping us is all volunteer basis. I don't even get paid for it. You know, so I don't know, over the thousands of hours that I've kind of put in to kind of get things, you know, on board and, you know, really taking things to the future. You know, none of us are really kind of getting compensated for our efforts. So I'd love to see that at some point, but that's really not our driver, our goal. So how much traffic are you guys getting right now? Like how much use, how many users are you seeing? How many transactions? Yeah, good questions. So we've got about 36, 3,700 people now registered with the site, uh, with the new 2.0 site, I should say. The 1.0 site, we had about 36,000 something users, uh, but we actually haven't reached out to them yet simply because I want to make sure that we've got, you know, everything, you know, all the bugs worked out, you know, before we really are kind of like, hey, you know what? Let's blast this hard. So I'm looking at this as more of like, all right, people that want to get in early and really kind of do some cool stuff with it, you know, jump on now. But yeah, we're seeing, 
actually, I'm really surprised because we're seeing, I want to say, maybe a good 50 to 60 new people coming in every week that are kind of signing up and joining. And the traffic has been increasing. How much trade volume we have been getting has been increasing. Um, the one downside, though, with trade volume is, well, people want to trade someplace where there's volume. Unfortunately, if there's no volume, people don't want to trade. So it's kind of this funny, like, uh, catch-22 where people want to use it, but only if there's trade volume, but people need to use it in order for there to be more trade volume. So, you know, we're what I'm really loving is that more people in the community are learning about this. I was really shocked when I was talking with some people and they thought Crypto Rush had, you know, no longer existed. I'm saying, no, we're going strong. You know, it's, it's like a brand new system. Uh, and it's, it's really cool when people are just getting the right information, how they're just kind of jumping on board and they're just like, yeah, let's do this. So kind of going on to your question about, you know, more specifically about volume and usage, I, I'm pleasantly surprised to see that it's just naturally happening. It's, it's not like we've got to fight for it to like, you know, oh, we need to figure out how do we get, you know, 10 more users today. It's more of just like this constant upward trend that's just kind of flowing as, as kind of people learn where things are going. So. Yeah, that's really cool. It's good to hear that people are coming to find these things and finding them useful and everything. Can you tell us about that, you know, kind of that 2.0 version, just how it's designed, what the user experience is like, and what people are going to see when they use the site? Yeah. So to answer that, let me back up a little bit more to give you a little bit more backstory around me. So in short, I don't really give my true identity in person now right now, except for a small select core of people. Um, you know, I'm expecting that to change in the future. Uh, my concern originally with that is just that while I actually consider myself someone who's actually out there to do good, people have been burned so much and people will react without thinking sometimes. So my concern is when I first started getting involved with Crypto Rush after they were affected, you know, I didn't want to end up like the, the bad coin guy in developer in the hospital all beat up, you know, <laughs> just getting accused for something that I didn't have any involvement with and I'm trying to get things sorted out, uh, you know, fixed. So a little bit about myself would be that I am a professional software developer. So it's kind of what I do. It's kind of my background and my history. I'm also pretty much a hacker. People pay me to break into systems, figure out how to defend them, you know, and do all kind of like tactical training for lack of a better way to put it. So it was almost like a perfect fit for me when I came along to kind of work with Crypto Rush. So when I first got involved, I saw that, yeah, all right, there's some serious issues with the system. And that's why I think it was on April, yeah, April 12th, we shut down the system hard because we realized that there are some serious, serious flaws and we had to take the system offline simply because it was so unreliable. So I'm pretty sure this is actually the first time we've, actually even shared this with the public, but yeah, we just couldn't rely on the old system. So at that point I sat down, I'm like, all right, we got to basically build the system from scratch. And we had a couple development teams that kind of failed on us. They said, oh yeah, we'd deliver, but nobody did. So a couple weeks later, I sat down and basically coded the whole thing myself. And I want to say about six to eight week time span for like the core engine. So I took off, you know, you know, my quote unquote vacation from work during my day job turned into <laughs> I'm at home coding this stuff, you know, to get things kind of squared away. So from the core up, it's all designed about like speed and security because my thought was like, all right, you know, as a trader, I want something that's going to be as fast as responsive as possible, but you need something to be secure. So every step and focus of everything that's been built has been around like real time updates. So if you're putting a bid on, and you click that, as soon as you do that, that's transmitted out to everybody else and you can see things happening in real time. So uh, you can take full advantage of whatever you want. Can you share a little bit real quick? I mean, as a podcast host, it's kind of my job to remain objective. So I will. I'm not, I'm not saying I believe any of this or anything like that, but just some people might be a little concerned if, you know, when somebody remains anonymous can you share maybe what some of your safeguards are and how you handle funds? Do you have any other people who can control funds and things like that? Yeah, valid question. And honestly, I would hope that somebody would ask that. So something else to mention, I'm seeing as things are growing and things are maturing in the future, information about myself will come out more. The new Crypto Rush is legally registered as a business in the United States. 
And, you know, those records are there and they can be found. I'm not looking to hide things. It's more of kind of protecting myself. And as things grow and do expand, I will be releasing who I am. And, you know, people are welcome to have all that kind of information about myself. But in the interim, yeah, I mean, you're basically just taking my word. You don't know me from anybody else except for the fact that, you know, when I say something, I do it and it's my track record. So the kind of steps and precautions that we have uh, right now, we've got a team about four other guys that are also really, you know, they see what happens. So we've got kind of like a dashboard where we're watching in real time. All right, these are the available funds that we've got. This is what we should have. And we can monitor these things so that if something does suddenly happen out of the ordinary, it's spiking up and it's pretty much on everybody's radar and dashboard. It's also set up so that while, yes, I am the admin and the guy that created it, you pretty much have to affect, I want to say, about four or five different mechanisms simultaneously to actually even impact or throw anything into the system that wasn't an actual uh, a trade. So I can't just go in and say, hey, I want to withdraw. Everything kind of ties together to kind of act like some fail-safes. Now, as with all things in the financial world, there is uh, levels of trust that really need to be there. Some of the ways that you get around there is you've got something where they kind of call well, you know, the rotate duties. So if someone is in charge of auditing one system, well, let's say they go on vacation for a short while and then somebody else kind of takes over what they were doing. Okay. So a lot of these standards for double-checking people's uh, work, not that you think they're necessarily going to be doing something, but it's more of like a, you're checking yourself, just making sure that everything's okay. So we have people that have worked in the banking industry that actually are on staff for a lot of lack of a better way to put it, even work with, you know, some of the airlines and just these standard practices that we've seen in non digital world stuff. We're kind of being able to pull that in and use that here at Crypto Rush. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Makes a lot of sense. And I think we look forward to seeing how all that plays out in the future and how everything develops and stuff like that. I'm sure people will be excited for that. What big plans do you have for the future of growing out, of extending Crypto Rush? And just, I don't know if you're even planning on making it bigger or if you're planning on going a different direction. Oh, yeah. So my plan is I want to see this to be kind of like the NASDAQ of the uh, cryptocurrency world. <laughs> the biggest thing I see for that is establishing trust. You know, I think we were talking offline earlier about, you know, there's so many people that have these stories about, you know, getting um, scammed or cheated. And it, it's, it's a real shame. I mean, there really is a lack of trust in this crypto world. So my hope and goal for that, first and foremost, is to kind of be that hope for the future. I mean, we really have had no standard for that. So, and yeah, I mean, again, I'm not expecting you guys to, you know, hear me say this and, oh yes, he's truthful. I mean, I want people to be judged by their actions and what they do, not necessarily their words. So to me, that's a huge thing. I want to build that up to be that, uh, that measure of trust so that, you know, if someone says something, they actually do it, you know, you can rely on them. One of the things more specifically with Crypto Rush that I want to see as well is we're constantly considering new ways, uh, new and additional ways, you know, we can protect our user base. So just because you set up a system doesn't necessarily mean that that's the end all be all. I want to set up a 2FA system, two factor authentication that doesn't rely on third party sites. I mean, depending if you agree with this or not, you know, nowadays users are getting tracked with everything that they do. And if suddenly your actions or these digital currencies are seen as a threat, you shouldn't be victimized or tracked on those ways. So we're kind of considering, all right, how can we protect our users? What other systems can we use? Because between you and me, I'm not really a big fan of using Google authentication if we want to consider, all right, how do we make sure our users' behavior isn't being tracked? So in conjunction with this, what I'm getting really excited about, this happened about two months ago and we've been working through it since, is that uh, we're looking at getting some real investment capital. So I was fortunate enough to connect with some people, you know, I don't know if we want to call it in the real world or in real life, but <laughs> some people that, you know, that's what they do for a living is that, you know, they, they kind of grow and build businesses. And they got really excited when they saw what we've done with Crypto Rush and the potential that we've got to really build this up so that we're, you know, I guess pulling in lots of capital resources, you know, big investors, gosh, it's kind of hard to not give away too much, but I mean, we're talking about, you know, building business plans that are, we're pulling in major investment entities, uh, you know, from New York and, and elsewhere. 
with that, I'm going to expect a huge expansion and we'll be able to kind of bring in a lot more professional help in areas that our current team doesn't have strengths in. I mean, let's be blunt. We're tech guys. We know how to, you know, harden and secure systems. We know how to, you know, code things and do things right. But when it comes to marketing and all those other aspects, that's not really our strengths. So that'll give us a really good opportunity that we can kind of push this to some really cool areas that I don't want to give away yet just because I don't want other people to kind of like try to steal some of our ideas. So. You're listening to the You, Me, and BTC podcast. We need your help. First of all, we'd love it if you could check out our website, youmeandbtc.com. There you can find donation addresses for every single article and episode. And we'd love it if you could make use of those. We could also use some fans and followers, so if you're willing, please visit Facebook or Twitter.com slash youmeandbtc. Lastly, remember to subscribe to the show. You can do that on iTunes or sign up on our website to receive email updates. Thanks for your support. I want to change gears just a little bit and kind of get some general thoughts on altcoins because we did... I think two or three episodes ago, we had an episode on altcoins, and it was a pretty awesome episode, lots of good insight and everything. So if you have any ideas, just any thoughts, in a really general way, just, I don't know, can you tell us what you think about altcoins, how they're important in the crypto world? I mean, I guess if you have any favorites, you could share those, but just, yeah, anything general about altcoins that you want to share? You know, if I had to choose one word to, I guess, summarize up altcoins and our, I guess, crypto world, if you want to call that, I'd have to pretty much call it innovation. That's what's cool about all these altcoins is that they first started as what Bitcoin, and then people were taking the concept and building upon it. So we've seen this basic Bitcoin, you know, which which, which, which all started, and then we saw Litecoin came in, and then we've we've seen a lot of people adapt these different ideas with different algorithms and all this cool stuff and it just it's just a beautiful way i've seen that people can just innovate and create the future yeah that's awesome and that's kind of what we came to again just in a general way it's that is it's really just all kinds of new ideas testing things out just see how things go see what people like what people use and let everybody experiment in their own little world and whatever's helpful that'll most certainly grow and become something amazing. So, yeah, we can all agree that, you know, we really don't know what the future holds as far as, you know, what's going to win out. But I, I'm pretty sure that everybody in our, it, that's kind of worked with this stuff knows that it's pretty much here to stay. What, what really gets me is that more recently I heard someone compare Bitcoin to a bag of rocks you can't carry around. And, you know, I, I don't know if anybody you know, listening knows what specifically I'm referring to, but I, it just, it's unfortunate because I feel like some of these people just get talking points and they have no idea what they're talking about or they've just been so misinformed. What I did find really interesting is that it seems like so many people are trying to come up with these weird scare tactics in, in general just to get people away from using these digital currencies. I think it's probably because they can't control it. Right. No, that's, we definitely talk about stuff like that too a lot i mean we get into some political or apolitical things all the time on the podcast and yeah we definitely like to talk about how people especially the government aren't really big fans of these things and try and put them down and so yeah that's definitely true we get into stuff like that a lot yeah someone had told me that uh you know i don't know you know it's for each person to decide what how they agree with this but that governments that are strong won't fear digital currencies and the ones that are let's say financially weak they will see this as a fear and a threat and do whatever they can to stop it so i guess my my question about this would be what kind of well first off what kind of if any what kind of stuff is affecting you legally right now what kind of restrictions what do you have to know about the people who use it and if 
there is anything that you know about coming in that you're going to have to worry about. Because I remember, I think back when we talked to, was it Purse that said that they were doing some extra stuff already? They didn't have to yet, but they were just doing it to get it out of the way because they were pretty sure it was coming. Yeah, I think it was Purse. That, I mean, I don't know if they okay. were doing extra stuff, but they were just kind of taking precautions and making assumptions and just trying to be as careful as possible. So, yeah, yeah, that's a good question. I don't yeah. know anything like that that you would have any thoughts on about regulation and anything you're worried about. Yeah, honestly, that's that's something that I really wonder about as far as like just the future of cryptocurrency in, in general. You know, and it kind of even kind of comes back to the whole idea of kind of protecting, you know, users because there's a fine line between, all right, let's collect all this information that's quote unquote necessary for tracking, you know, bad people as opposed to, all right, we want to know everything that you do and whatever you do with your time. And that's actually like a big concern from the standpoint of from you, the U.S. dollar, for example. So any financial institution, you know, that kind of deals with, you know, holding money or, you know, acting like, like a broker, you pretty much kind of fall into that whole world of regulations, you know, by the financial commission. So that's kind of a big concern because in general, that stuff isn't exactly cheap. And they also have a lot of regulations as far as, okay, how much information do you know about your users? You know, limiting their transactions based upon how much information you have about them. And it just really kind of, to me, it's, it's, it's a battle between what crypto world stands for a lot of people and what they're trying to escape from in the actual, I don't know if we want to call it fiat currency world, uh, you know, with when you're, whether you're dealing with the U.S. dollar or some other currency, that you could say it's almost like this war or battle between the two. So it's pretty important from one standpoint of, all right, well, if I want to, if I want to help encourage people to kind of get into the Bitcoin world, first off, they're going to have to convert their whatever currency into Bitcoins. So if I'm going to do that, that means I've got to kind of get into that whole brokerage world which could, like I said, put restrictions on what information I've got to collect from people, which I don't want to do. Right. And yeah, then you've got to worry about, well, what if they suddenly want to try to seize your funds? So there's a lot of elements that, you know, really have to be considered and done correctly, I think, in order to protect people's uh, freedoms and their funds. In, in truth, I don't think that the United States is going to be the safest place for that in the future. Right. I think we would have similar concerns and just who knows what they could do with the laws and regulations about this stuff. And I guess on a related note, I'll say, what do you think of anonymity? I mean, it sounds like that's something that you want to preserve as much as possible in crypto rush. Do you have plans for that? Do you see yourself as being able to remain anonymous as much as possible? Yeah, I would say that that is pretty much a core fundamental tenant of crypto rush and where it needs to be and you know my thought is as long as you're not doing anything illegal go have fun you know i mean it's none of my business now i mean if somebody is doing something that's hurting others or, or whatever you know i mean hey i'm, I'm going to be on board with making sure that that's stopped but as far as tracking people knowing what they're up to you i i don't think that that's Nobody has any business kind of getting involved in that area, and it's it's definitely where I think the future is going that has to be embraced. I guess I will ask another thing that's fairly related, and I don't know, it's just it, this is kind of fun talking about old episodes and important topics and stuff. Our very last episode was about whitelisting and blacklisting with Bitcoin addresses, and it was really interesting because all three of us co-hosts, I know there's only two here now, but all three of us, we support freedom, we support anonymity, and yet when we thought about it, we kind of came to the conclusion that even though so many people are really against whitelists and blacklists, we actually didn't think it would be that big a deal as long as they were voluntary, privately managed lists. Do you have any thoughts on that, and do you think those kind of lists are okay? I don't know, just any thoughts on that? You know, that, that's very interesting when, when you mention that. And it, it actually makes me think of a particular incident that, although directly unrelated, people were trying to solve a similar problem where 
one of the coins that we were actually looking at relisting on Crypto Rush, we were kind of going through the old wallet and then we're trying to move funds. And then for some reason, the wallet daemon was actually crashing and we're trying to figure out, well, what the heck's going on? So we actually finally contacted the, the current coin devs. And it turns out that the original coin dev had, I guess, kind of scammed and he got a bunch of coins when they first launched it. And when these new devs came over, they're like, well, this guy shouldn't get any of their funds. Well, the problem with that is that a lot of these original funds that had gotten, I guess, stolen by the developer, those were put in some particular addresses and then those were moved to Crypto Rush. Well, by them blacklisting that, that actually made it so we couldn't give those coins back to our, our, our users. So, huh. yeah, it was really kind of a weird situation. So it's kind of like, then we got to start negotiating with them to figure out, okay, well, yeah, okay, but these coins aren't owned by this user. You should get, unlock them. You know, it became a really weird situation. So although we're talking about this whole whitelisting, blacklisting thing, you know, with Bitcoin, you kind of run into some similar issues that could come up. So if you say you've got a controlled list of, all right, well, we'll accept things from this address, but not from these address, what happens if those get actually transferred to another address? Right. You know, you, you kind of run into this whole chain cascade effect. Now, I will agree that I don't think it's right in general to block it at all. I mean, that'd be like, I, I like to think of Bitcoin almost like all the gold in the world. Well, while it's true that I'm sure that there's some you know, back if we want to look back in history, I'm sure there were some realms that basically said, all right, well, this gold coin that's stamped with, let's say, the Persian Empire, I'm not going to accept that, but I'll take, you know, whatever stamp from the Roman Empire, you know, something like that. Yeah. But it's a little different with the Bitcoin world because, in a way, I think you can you almost break the system, and it kind of de defines the whole point of it. So you really shouldn't be going after the currency itself. You should be going after the person who maybe controls it. Or, I'm sorry, not the, like, the wallet. So I'm not saying, um, yeah, I think trying to go after that person as opposed to blocking the funds is going to be a much better, uh, solution in the end. Yeah, no, I think that's really interesting. Do you have any thoughts on that, Tim? That's not completely in line with kind of what we came to, but it's definitely a, an understandable concern and something that, I don't know, kind of needs to be considered and dealt with. Anything, Tim? Not, not much else besides what you already said. <laughs> well, do you think that, I don't know. How how would you solve that problem with, okay, what do you think should be done with those coins if somebody, I don't know, steals them or just does something bad and their address gets blacklisted, but those coins end up at somebody else's address? I mean, they're in a way they're stolen or at least, I don't want to say bad money, but they kind of came from a bad source and, and if it was clear enough and if everybody could kind of agree with that, what do you think should be done then with the person that ends up with that money but didn't actually do anything wrong? Do you have any thoughts on how that should be dealt well, with? No, because you can't say they're not doing anything wrong because then there wouldn't be a question. Obviously, you think they did something wrong by either accepting the money or no, I if mean, it was like a bad thing. or I mean, what do you do if one person does something wrong that everybody kind of agrees is a bad thing. And then that money gets transferred to somebody else without them really knowing where it came from. Somebody else gets the money and then people find out where it came from. They find out that the original address was a bad address, something like that. And King Dragon, you can correct me if this isn't the right scenario, but that kind of seems like what's happened. So somebody innocent has the money, but somebody I know it's hard to define innocent and guilty, but somebody innocent has the money, but it came from a guilty place. What should be done with the money? And how do you deal with it? Yeah, I mean, I think it, from what you originally said, if it's stolen, then I think it, it still belongs to the person it was stolen from. Maybe if you could then have the person who did the stealing then give the, the person who they paid the stolen money who had to, had to give the money back or who people wanted to give the money back, compensate them. But when you're talking about getting money from like a bad source, I can't really say that there's too much of what you can do there because really, not to say that it's better because of this, but just like looking at like the dollars in my wallet, I'm pretty sure most of this money in my wallet has been done, <laughs> it's been paid for stuff that I don't really agree with or has been involved in something I don't really agree with. Because there's only, it just gets moved around. I don't think money, I think I said this something 
one of the last times we were talking, but just because something is used in something bad doesn't mean then it's bad. Like I think I use it as an example of talking about anonymity. I don't think it's bad anonymity when it's used for something I don't agree with, and it's good anonymity whenever it's used for something I do agree with. Same thing with the money. I don't, I don't think it being used for something that I don't agree with or that we all don't agree with compared to like the people who are doing it. I don't think it makes the money necessarily bad. I mean, that's up to you if you don't want to accept it. If you, and I'm not even saying that I would accept it. I just don't think that we can be like, no, you can't, you can't use that. That's bad money or something like that. Yeah. It'd be interesting if you look at it from the standpoint of, uh, let's take a real world example of, all right, let's say somebody wires like 30 Bitcoin to a terrorist organization and we see, oh gosh, in that address, they've got, you know, 30 Bitcoins. Let's blacklist it. Well, so what happens if, or so pretty much the entire network would probably have to accept that, yes, this is, this is a bad address. We're going to blacklist it and it can't be moved or, or whatever. One, how do we handle reaping those? Or are we just going to take them out of the system completely? Two, how about those guys went out to the grocery store and bought a bunch of groceries at some point? Well, that merchant has accepted those in exchange for goods. Right. You know, because that's going to have to probably hit for that address gets blacklisted. So then does the merchant lose that funds? You know, there, there's some interesting things that would have to be sorted out before any kind of locking out of money took place. And that's why, you know, I agree, you know, with, you know, what you were saying about it, it's not necessarily the money that's bad. It's, it's about kind of, going after them and not necessarily their their address itself. Yeah. Right, I totally agree. It's pretty tough, and I don't even know if that really has been solved, that kind of problem. Maybe somebody will have some crazy ideas in the future, but right now it's just something that people have to think through and just kind of figure out, well, hey, what are we going to do with this money? Are we going to accept it? Are we going to, if we're a miner, are we going to process transactions with it or are we going to refuse them? I don't know. It's a tough thing to think about. All right. Well, I mean, sweet. I, that was pretty fun. That was a good kind of tangent there. But then, yeah, what, what we'll like to end with is another thing that's a little bit different. But again, we just try and do it with all of our guests. Can you share some kind of personal story in this crypto world? kind of anything goes here just maybe there's somebody cool that you met some way that you saw you know with your own eyes how this stuff can change the world i don't know any kind of cool story a funny story whatever you got is there anything that you'd want to share like that yeah sure so you know i really i've got to say that um i'm pretty amazed by a lot of the people that i meet and and i don't mean that in the in the sense of wow these people are really crazy although there are some of those too there are really just some very selfless and helpful people, uh, you know, really kind of coming into the crypto rush world. I don't know, I don't know how to put it in the crypto rush world, but more of just like the, the circle of it that at first there were a lot of people that were really just kind of, you know, paranoid, I guess you could say, or really angry or not listening to the truth. And, you know, you get, you get those internet trolls. But what really surprised me is that the people that are really hung around really cared they really want to see a difference and a lot of people are really just not looking for self-gain. So that to me, I, I think has really surprised me because from the get go, I think it's, you know, as we stated earlier, the, the status quo is that most people are out to screw somebody else and that everybody's just trying to make a quick buck. So it's really, really opened my eyes and I'd say it's just really been helpful to kind of shape where we've been able to go now. I mean, I, would say that the, the three people that come to mind right now would be like Gmaz, Xenox, and J, JC Junior two two two, who are the guys that kind of comprise the core of Crypto Rush right now. That I mean, everybody's put in so much time and effort, and although you know they have a vested interest, you know, because everybody kind of brought some Crypto Rush shares, it's not really their driving force, you know. So I, I think it's just the fact that there's people out there that are out to help people. It, it just gives me hope that you know this isn't just something that's going to kind of die out and that, you know, we can really turn this around. So, Right, yeah, I think we would totally agree that community is a huge part of this movement, all this crypto stuff. It's just there are some awesome people in here, and it's great to be able to meet people and work with people and all that stuff. So that's really cool. 
Yeah, we just like to, at the end, ask any guests we have for uh, their contact info and um, how people can follow you and get in touch, try to follow with what you're doing. Yeah, so the easiest way to get a hold of me was actually probably going to be on IRC. I hang out there, and uh, my alias is King Dragon, one word. Uh, alternately, uh, my Twitter is the one King Dragon, and that's the number one. Uh, we've also got our official Crypto Rush newsfeed or Twitter, which is the Crypto Rush, and then our blog, which we finally just got up that has no entries at the moment, is blog.cryptorush.in. Well, hey, yeah, this was. King Dragon from Crypto Rush, an awesome altcoin exchange. Thanks for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yep, thanks. Thanks for listening to episode 49. All of the music in today's show was from John Stewart. We'll see you next Thursday. 